Thank you, Brian. Thank you to the ushers. Thank you, Nathan, for leading us in worship this morning. I'm going to go ahead and ask if you have your Bible with you this morning, which hopefully you do. If you would open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this morning, we will look at verses 11 through 21. And as you're turning there, I will just mention that it's not our intention this morning to look at every detail that's in this text. Uh, We are going to highlight a few things that are uh, important for us, uh, but we will not touch on every single detail that's in this specific text. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11 to 21. Uh, Last week, we spent some time reflecting on how Christmas is ultimately about the cross of Jesus Christ. Although we tend to busy ourselves with a lot of different things during this season, uh, important things like family and tradition and decorations and even Christmas gifts, we know ultimately that Christmas means nothing apart from the cross where Jesus died. Uh, This is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is about a savior who was born uh, for the purpose of dying, making atonement for sins, dying on the cross that we might uh, be forgiven. Without the cross, like we said last week, uh, Christmas has absolutely no meaning at all. So last week we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we saw and were reminded of the truth that the gospel is that which is of first importance. So there's all kinds of things that are worthy of discussing and learning in God's word. Uh, Things like how we ought to live or how we ought to speak or how we ought to relate with one another. Different theological systems. And none of these things matter apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, dear church, the gospel must be our starting point. We must get the gospel right. And like we said last week week and we've said many times the gospel according to Romans 1 16 is the power of God unto salvation and it's also the the power of God by which all godly living flows and I would highlight to you one of my favorite verses Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 which uh, encourages us to live lives worthy of the calling to which we have been called if you remember when we went through the book of Ephesians the first three chapters of Ephesians are all about the gospel it's all about what God has done for us in Christ he's blessed blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Although we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he's made us alive together with Christ. So the first three chapters are all gospel. And then you get to Ephesians chapter four, verse one, and it is now live in light of the gospel that you declare. And so the gospel, yes, is the power of God unto salvation, but it's also the power of God by which we live godly lives, by which uh, we live lives that are pleasing to God. And so this morning, dear church, this is really where we are heading. The the power of the gospel is uh, the power of God to change our very lives. So the gospel is not merely something we understand or explain or just kind of keep in our back pocket for that final day. The gospel is, is the power of God, the power of God's Holy Spirit to radically transform our very lives. So just a few brief examples. The, the gospel transforms uh, tax collectors like Matthew. So we've been going through the gospel of Matthew. We've taking a little break and we'll get back into it at the beginning of the new year, but the gospel transforms tax collectors, probably thieves and liars like Matthew transforms them into devoted followers of Jesus Christ. The gospel transforms doubters like James, the half-brother of Jesus, who thought Jesus was crazy when he walked the earth. But when Jesus rose from the dead, James was transformed by the power of the gospel and became a bold declarer of Jesus Christ and was actually a martyr. The gospel transforms Christian killers like Paul into evangelists. You see, churches, we reflect on what Christmas is about. We must be a people who ponder and dwell on on Christmas implications. Now, we know, dear church, that Christmas is about Jesus. And Christmas isn't about Santa or candy canes or nice decorations. Christmas is about Jesus the Christ. And the reason Christmas is about Jesus is because of what he came to accomplish, what he came to do. Jesus came to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins that we might have everlasting life, but also he came and he died that we might have transformed life, new life uh, in the present day. So church, uh, maybe to help us a little bit this morning, think of it like this. Uh, Have you ever, and you don't have to answer out loud because that might get a little chaotic, but just think in your head. Have, Have you ever received a Christmas gift that changed your life, that absolutely transformed you? 
Now, my guess is you're thinking right now about all kinds of great gifts that you received throughout your life. Uh, I remember in high school when I got uh, snow skis. I, I wanted snow skis, and I got snow skis. It was a great gift. I've gotten all kinds of wonderful gifts. But my guess is, is that as you are thinking about the different gifts you've received uh, throughout your life on Christmas morning, my guess is that there has never been a gift that has absolutely transformed your life. Maybe it made a season of life a little more fun. Maybe it made things a little easier. Maybe you enjoyed it for a while, but it did not transform your life. So church, I received a, a gift uh, about uh, a couple weeks ago, a little, a little gift, but for me, it's a game changer. And some of you are going to maybe chuckle a little bit, but this week from one of you all, I received hand sanitizer from somebody. And church, if you know me, this is fantastic, especially this hand sanitizer, because I don't have to squeeze it and rub it in. I just, I just spray it. Look at this. I just spray a little hand sanitizer, and I can even put it back here and do this, right? I got hand sanitizer. Now, church, this is fantastic. I love this stuff. Again, it's a game changer for me, but did it change my life? No, church. It made things a little more convenient. It made things a little nicer for me, but it did not change my life. You see, church, the point I'm trying to make this morning is that there is only one gift that changes our life, that radically transforms us, and that is the gospel of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ. It does not change our life temporarily. The gospel isn't something that we cling to for like a week or a month or a year and then we just kind of forget about it and then go back to life as usual. The gospel is meant to radically transform us, to radically change us. And so that's where we're headed this morning, dear church. The main point of our sermon is simply this. Christmas is about the gospel by which we receive the gift of new life to be lived out for all to see. Christmas Christmas is about the gospel by which we receive the gift of new life to be lived out for all to see. And so church, let's uh, look into this text uh, this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 11. And again, I want to remind you, we're not going to highlight every single thing that's in this text. We will highlight a few things that I think are important for us this morning. Starting in verse 11, 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no, no longer live for themselves, but for him who, for their sake, died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Will you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you so much for uh, your word, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides and leads us and directs us into all truth. And Father, we pray this morning that you would remind us of the biblical reality that you speak of in John 15 that apart from you, we can do nothing. Father, we pray this morning that you, by your grace and your mercy and your strength and your spirit, that you might enable us, your people, to abide in Christ. God, that you might grow us into the image of the Son. Father, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would encourage us where we need encouragement, that you'd remind us of things that maybe we've forgotten about, Father, that you would convict us where we need to be convicted. God, may we be a people this morning who submit in every way to the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that 
that I might decrease, I pray that we might decrease and that Jesus would be the one who increases, that Jesus would be the one who's glorified, that this morning the thoughts would not be on the preacher or on the music, but Lord, our thoughts and our hearts would be fixated on Christ, our King. And so, Father, we submit this time to you for your glory and your purposes, and we trust you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So, dear church, to get where we're headed this morning, uh, the first thing we need to do is talk a little bit about need, a little bit about our need, our greatest need. Now, I don't intend to spend a lot of time here because we've talked much about this very thing recently, but again, I think it's important that we highlight it so this morning uh, everything just kind of connects and makes sense. Now, church, we know that the greatest need for every human being boils down to the heart. It's not simply, dear church, that we do wish wicked things or say wicked things or think things that are bad. It's, it's that we are, apart from God, a people who are wicked by our very nature. A good example of this would be uh, if you have children, right? The, the children that you have. For, for me, it'd be like the, my youngest, the twins. So church, I didn't uh, take my twin boys and teach them how to hit each other. I didn't teach them how to steal toys from each other. I didn't teach them how to do any of that stuff. Church, they learned that on their own. It was all on their own that they learned those skills, how to hit each other and punch and slap and do all that kind of stuff because they are born wicked. They're born evil. They're born with a dark, wicked heart, just like you and I. So church, this is a truth that is fundamental to biblical Christianity. It's absolutely essential that we understand this. You will never, ever know Christ unless you come to understand the depths of your depravity, the depths of your wickedness, how great your need really is. People who think they are good uh, cannot see their need for a savior. They're never going to see that they need Jesus. They're never going to see that they need forgiveness of sins. If you don't think that you're sick, then you'll never take medicine. Now, the question naturally arises as we think about these things, why are we a people who are bad by our very nature? Why are we a people who are bad? Well, God's word, dear church, has a very clear diagnosis, and the diagnosis is the heart. The problem for you and I from the moment of conception is our heart. Left to ourselves, we have a heart that is very, very, very sick to say the least. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful, it's sick, it's wicked. Who can understand it? Spiritually speaking, the Bible says our hearts are dead with no life. Apart from God and his grace, our hearts are dead with no life. Now, church, we could spend the next hour pressing things here and clarifying things here. We could talk about biblical events and biblical characters that make this point. We could even talk about the the news of the day to make this point that humanity is wicked apart from Christ. But church, we don't need to do that this morning because deep down, you know, this is true. Every single one of us knows this is true, even if you try to hide it, even if you try to pretend you're really good and you're really righteous and you only say nice things and you only help people out, you know deep down that apart from God, you are wicked. You are in desperate need. And a good good way to illustrate this is just our thoughts, right? Now, you might be able to hide your thoughts and do nice things, but if we were to take what is in your head and the things that you've thought about other people and the things that you've, you know, dwelt on and we were to put it up on the screen for everybody to see, would you be proud or would you be ashamed? Well, my guess is everyone in here would hide their face and they might even run out of this very place because church, we know that even if we tried to hide our wickedness with good actions, our thoughts testify before God that we are a people who are wicked, who have bad, dead hearts before God. So church, what we see here is that all humanity has need. We read it this morning in Psalm 53, and it's repeated in Romans chapter 3. None are good. None are righteous. None will seek God. No one. Right? We are all a people who are in need, and the need is for a new heart. Without a new heart, we are doomed to dead life before God. Now, some may still protest a little bit and say, you know what? Why does all this matter? 
Like, what, what's going on here? Why can't I just train myself to live better? Why can't I just modify my behavior? Over time, I'll just train myself, train myself, and then I'll be good. Then I'll change my heart. Why can't I do it by myself? And this leads us to where we are headed next. The reason why can't we can't be a people who just simply modify our behavior and neglect the heart, right, and just think about the outward, is simply because God says the heart matters. I mean, God is the creator of the cosmos. He's the one who gets to decide what is right and what is wrong, what is good, what is bad. He's the one, dear church, who says the heart of man matters. If the creator of the cosmos says the heart of man matters, then we better listen. Now, church, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that the heart is of, of, of utmost importance to God. Now, obviously, church, you know by now we're not talking about the organ that is beating in your chest. We're talking about the place from which all human actions and all all human thoughts, all human words. It's the place where all those things flow from. The heart is the place or the source of morality, emotion, desiring, determining, wisdom, and on and on we could go. And Jesus in Mark chapter 7 speaks of the heart being the source of the actions that we engage in. Now in Mark chapter 7 verse 21 you don't need to turn there, but there's an issue. There's an issue with the Pharisees and the disciples of Jesus. The disciples of Jesus are not following the traditions of the religious elites, and they, they have not washed their hands properly before they've eaten. And so the Pharisees are making this accusation that you are defiling yourself. You have not obeyed the traditions, uh, our traditions, and so you have now defiled yourself because you did not wash your hands. And so I don't want to spend a ton of time here, but listen to what Jesus says about the heart starting in verse, excuse me, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, this is what Jesus says. For what comes from within, out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. And so church, what is Jesus getting at here? He's saying it's, it's not the fact that you disobeyed a tradition that defiles you. It's the actions that are flowing from your heart, right? If you're engaging in slander or pride or sexual immorality, these are things that are coming from a bad source, a bad heart. So God says repeatedly throughout the Bible that the heart is his focus. The heart is what matters. And I think a prime example of this is a story that's very, very familiar to many of us. And it's the story of Samuel anointing David to be the next king over Israel. This is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 through 7. So you know the story, I'm sure, pretty well. God rejects Saul as king. He goes and he tells the prophet Samuel, Samuel, it's time to anoint a new king over the land, a new king over Israel. And so at God's command, Samuel heads to Jesse's house, a man named Jesse. And, and Samuel says, line up your sons, Jesse, right? Because God's about to anoint the next king. The next king is going to be anointed over Israel. So Jesse goes and gets his sons. He lines them all up. And Samuel looks over the sons and he sees Eliab, the first son. And in verse 16, it seems as though Samuel's thinking, look, this is the guy. Eliab's the guy. I mean, he is, he is he's tall, he's handsome, he, he looks kingly. I mean, Samuel essentially, uh, in, at least in my mind, has his anointing oil out. I mean, he's ready to anoint Eliab the next king. And then God says in verse 7, Samuel, stop. Stop, Samuel. And maybe Samuel thought, why? Why stop? I mean, Eliab looks the guy. Don't we want the big, strong, confident guy leading the nation? Isn't that what God is after? Well, God says no. God says no. God is after the heart, not the outward appearance. And again, we know this very well. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
And so we can continue to read in the story and we know that Samuel ends up anointing David. David was out in the field. David comes in. Samuel anoints him, this little shepherd boy, to be the next king over Israel. And David is described over and over in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. Now, church, I trust that much of what we've talked about so far is review for us, but hopefully it's a good reminder, a a good reminder that the main problem for humanity concerns that which is of utmost importance importance to God, the heart, the place from which actions, thoughts, and words flow. Now, church, thankfully, God does not lead us spiritually dead and with no hope. He just doesn't say, look, your heart is bad and wicked. You have no hope. See you later. That's not what God does, but rather through the person and work of Jesus Christ, God meets our greatest need. God does a supernatural heart work on his sheep, if you will. And I think that our text that we read this morning sort of, uh, speaks to this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so this is God meeting our greatest need, doing this supernatural heart work. He's taking our, our wicked hearts and the, the condemnation and the punishment we deserve and he takes that and he lays it on Christ and then he takes the, the perfection of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, and he and he transfers that over to us, so that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you and I. This is the heart work that God does for His sheep, right? This is what God is doing, and in doing so, what He does is He makes us new creations in Christ. We're new creations. We have new hearts. The heart of stone is taken out. A heart of flesh is put in. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Again, dear church, for those who are in Christ, there's no longer, according to Ezekiel 36.26, there's no longer a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. A heart that is now being molded into the image of Jesus himself. This is what we hope for, right? That that God has predestined us to be conformed into the image of the Son. He's doing that. Do you know him, church? Do you love him, church? If you belong to him, that's what he's doing in you. He's conforming you. He's sanctifying you. He's, uh, He's making you like his son. He's given you a heart that is now growing uh, to to have new desires and new thoughts, a heart that is the source of new kinds of actions. Now, dear church, this is what Christmas is all about. And this is why we're talking about it this morning. Christmas is about a savior who was born to die for wicked sinners that they might be forgiven and reconciled to God and then live a life that is visibly different than how they lived before. Right? The, the gospel is not us getting saved. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. I get, I, I'm saved and I'm, I'm forgiven. And then I just keep doing what I used to do. That, that's not the, what, what, the, what the Bible tells us, what the Bible teaches us. No, no, what, what this is about, what Christmas is about is a, a, a savior born to die, that we're reconciled to God and then we live differently. The gospel gift of a new heart should change you and I forever. It's not like the gifts that you receive on Christmas morning. Right? Many of us parents know uh, your, your kids will receive a bunch of gifts, they'll play with them for three days, and then you just got a giant mess you got to deal with. Because right? then they get kind of bored with all these gifts. That's not the gospel. The gospel doesn't change us temporarily. The gospel isn't something that we get fired up about for three weeks and then forget about it and go back to life as usual. You see, church, no longer are we rotten trees producing rotten fruit before God, but we are now good trees by God's grace with roots in Christ that grow to produce good fruit. According to Ezekiel 37, we were those dead bones. We were the valley of dead, dry bones, but God has given us by his grace and through the work of his son, new life. And church, this life is made visible And it should be made visible. It should be evident for people to look on and see and witness, right? That we're different than what we used to be. We're not the same. 
And I think, dear church, specifically, one of the ways that people should be witnessing the, the radically changed lives that, that are ours because of God's grace is in how we live uh, progressively to obey his commands. And, and specifically, how we learn to obey the first and second commandment. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is the fruit of genuine salvation, dear church. This is the, 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 the gift of, of sanctification. That yeah, you're, you're secure for eternity. You belong to him. You're reconciled to God, but your life is changed here. You're growing to love God day by day by day. You're seeing him as more worthy and, more, and, and most beautiful. And you're growing to love your neighbor as yourself. And so church, with the time that we have left, I just want to simply focus on these two marks of new life in Christ. These two marks, love God and love your neighbor. So, so church, let's start with, with loving God. I would say to you this morning, a new heart by God's grace means new life that is marked by love for God. So we know, dear church, and I just mentioned it a moment ago, that love for God is the first and greatest commandment. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Uh, a, a lawyer comes up to Jesus, asks him, you know, what's the, the greatest commandment? That kind of conversation takes place, and Jesus says it. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, church, if we are truly those who are in Christ with new hearts and new life, then our very lives should be marked by the, this growing love for God. I think in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 12 to 15, it appears this was true of Paul and his companions. Let me read it for us. Starting in verse 12, down to verse 15. It says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now, essentially, dear church, I think Paul is saying this. He's saying, look, it's not about us. It's, it's not about what, what, what we do and, and, and how awesome we might look. What it's about, it's, a, it's about Christ and it's about what he did for us. And because he died for us, we are now those who are completely sold out for him. Now, now dear church, we know that this was true of a guy like Paul, don't we? We know that a guy like Paul was completely sold out for, for the, the glory of God and, and the purpose of proclaiming the gospel. Amen, church? Right? Paul was sold out. I mean, this guy was a Christian hater. Right? And I don't think that's, that's too strong of a word. Paul was a Christian hater. He was a Christian killer. He hated Jesus. And then by God's grace, Paul was saved and he was given this new life that we're talking about this morning. Paul is saved, not just that he might live with God forever, but he was saved that he might be radically different in his life on earth, how he lived. And, and, and you know from reading the New Testament that Paul's life was not marked by sitting in his lazy boy drinking lemonade and just hanging out. That's not what Paul's life was marked by. Paul's life was marked by service to God. Now, Paul was all in on serving God, working for his glory. Paul was not like I can be and not like many of us can be where we're kind of in when it's comfy and then we're out when it's hard. And then we're in when it's comfy and then we get out when it's hard. That's not Paul. I mean, he's in whether disciples are being made and people are coming to Christ. And he's also in when he's getting beaten. And he's getting cursed at. And he's getting thrown out of cities and left for dead. See, Paul had this new life. And because he had this new life in Christ, he gave himself to be exhausted for God's glory and the advancement of the gospel. You see, Paul underwent a miraculous transformation from God hater to God lover. And church, the reason I bring all this up this morning is simply this. If you belong to Christ this morning, if you say you belong to him, then this transformation that we're talking about should be evident in you. It should be evident in me. That we are a people who are growing to love 
God, like we sang this morning, growing to adore God, growing to, to be all out in service for him and his glory. And so church, let me ask you today, are you experiencing this new life by a growing love for God? Are you increasingly over the course of your Christian life giving yourself over to him, learning to give yourself over to him, learning that it's good to be tired for the sake of the gospel? Do we find ourselves growing to hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves? Are we still just kind of hanging out in that spot where we're like, well, it's okay, I can laugh at things that God hates and he calls an abomination. It's no big deal. Are we growing to say, no, God, that grieves God's heart. And because his life's in me, I can't laugh at that. I can't enjoy that. Growing to love the things he loves and hate the things he hates. Do you truly adore him? Do you hunger for him like you hunger for a meal? And most of us, if we, if we miss breakfast, if we miss lunch, and we, we, we know it, we feel it, and we'll, and we'll, we'll t- make effort to, to, to satisfy our belly, won't we? We'll, we'll stop at a fast food place. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll do anything we can. We'll hit up a vending machine. We'll do anything we can to, to satisfy the physical hunger that's in our gut. But let me ask us, church, do we hunger for God the way we hunger for food? When you haven't been with him, when you haven't been in his word, do you feel it? Do you say, God, I need you. I have to have you. It's you, it's your word that sustains me. Now, church, you have to understand this morning, I am not in any way trying to heap up condemnation on you. Because if you're like me, you're answering these questions and you're, these questions and you're thinking, well, no, 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 I'm not there. I'm not there. I'm not there. I still got a long way to go. Church, I'm not in any way trying to heap up condemnation. Because I know that none of us are perfect. But what I am hoping to do is to encourage the saints. To encourage you who belong to Christ to fight for these things. To not be lazy Christians. And I'll I'll confess to you this morning, my tendency is to be a lazy Christian. Now that's, that's, that's just my, that's my tendency. That's what I'll naturally drift to is just to be a lazy Christian. I didn't get around to reading God's word. I didn't get around to it today. That's my tendency. And that's why I say we have to fight for these things. And you have to keep fighting. And you have to keep striving. We ought to be praying for these things. God, help me to love you. God, I know I got a long way to go, but I want to love you. I want to see you as supreme. Give me eyes to see your beauty. I'm saying these things not to heap up condemnation, but to encourage you to pursue these things and to keep on pursuing them and never to kick back and think you've arrived, but to keep pleading with God, help me to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Like I said just a moment ago, I think we can so easily slip back into our flesh and fall for fool's gold. Right? I think I've shared this before, but when I was uh, in my teens, I used to do a lot of gold panning with my cousin. We'd go up for a week or maybe two into the woods, and we'd get by a creek, and we'd pan for gold, and it was fantastic. I have wonderful memories, but I remember early on, we would fall for the fake stuff. And we'd go gold panning, and we would dig holes and get under rocks and do all this work, and we'd see shiny things in the dirt, and we'd think, there it is! Right? It's gold! Only to find out later on, that's not gold, that's the fake stuff. That's fool's gold. We were putting all this effort in to digging a hole that was only producing fake gold. And at church, I think too often we can fall for the fake stuff. We can get so wrapped up in the cares of this life. Not that there aren't things we should be caring about, there are. We take care of our family. We love our wife like Christ loved the church. We gotta provide, I I get it. There are things that we care about, but we can get so caught up in that stuff, that we neglect the true treasure, that we neglect God, his glory, love for him. So church, we must be diligent and we must be determined and we must be immersed in prayer. God, help me to love you. My prayer for us this morning is that our lives would be filled with with growing devotion for God, growing love for God above everything that this world has to offer. 
that we would be like that blazing fire that's growing hotter and hotter and hotter by the day in our desire, in our adoration, in our hope to serve him and advance the gospel. And so church, what we see is the, that the first mark of a, a new heart, this new life that is ours in Christ is a growing love for God. Growing love for God. But this actually leads us to the second point. And, it, and it's simply this, that we ought to love our neighbor. See, if we truly love God, then the Bible says we will love those who are made in his image. The, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Verse 20, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So church, if we are those who are growing to love God, one of the ways that that is, that is seen, one of the evidences of a growing love for God is love for those who are made in his image. And I think Paul kind of gets at this in, in verses 16 through 21. I want to reread it for us. Again, we won't highlight everything here, but we'll highlight a few things. Paul says, from now on, therefore, we, reg we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the ministry or the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so church, our, our second point this morning, a really sub point, is just simply uh, a new heart means new life that is marked by love for others. So the first thing I want to talk about this morning is, is, is Paul's love for the lost, right? Though Paul's love that I think is demonstrated here in this text for those who are separate from the body of Christ. So we'll make this brief because I plan on talking a little bit more about this next week, but I want us to notice uh, how in 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul demonstrates his love for the lost. Read it again, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So how does Paul love the lost? Well, church, I'll tell you, it's not simply by being a, a nice guy. Paul is not loving the lost by simply thinking, you know what, I'll just really try hard to never, ever, ever offend anybody. No, what I gather from this in verse 20 is that Paul is loving the lost by pleading with them to be reconciled to God through faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is how he's demonstrating a genuine love for the people who are outside the, the body of Christ. Now, now church, you, you have to hear me, and I want to make sure I'm clear here. I'm not saying in any way that we should not love the lost by being kind. Obviously, be kind. We should, we should not be giving people unnecessary reason to be offended, right? We shouldn't be going out of our way to offend people. Yes, we should be kind. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 15, to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is yours, but to do it with gentleness and respect. So yes, be kind. Absolutely. But what church I am saying is the greatest way that we demonstrate our love for the lost is sharing the gospel with them. And this is something I think that can be very much neglected inside church circles because we can get so focused on everything that's happening in here that we forget evangelism. To share Jesus with people who need to hear it. It does not make any sense if we really believe the things that we read in this book to not share Jesus with the lost. How could we say that we love people who are made in the image of God and just sit back while they head down the road of condemnation, eternal condemnation? How could you say you love somebody? It doesn't make any sense at all. How could you say you love somebody while you withhold the medicine that's going to make them better? 
Yeah, I, I love you. Here's a, here's a drink of cold water. Here's a nice meal. But I'm going to withhold the thing that's really going to heal you. That's not love. That's hate. That is hate. And so church, new life in Christ should be marked. New life in Christ should be marked by pleading with people to believe on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, I need to talk to more non-believers about Jesus. Whether they like me or they hate me, whether they're, it's awkward or weird or whatever, I need to talk to more people about Jesus. And, I, my, and my assumption is for many of us, that's true of you as well. I, I need to talk to more people about Jesus. When I, when I go to the, to, the, to, the, to the store, it's not simply about me getting in and getting out and getting the best deals. It's, it's, it's possible opportunities to share Jesus I want to be bold for the gospel. And so church, again, one of the, one of the greatest marks of love for our neighbor, those who are outside the body, is sharing the gospel. We need to do it more. But the second thing I want to focus on this morning is, is, is love for one another. To love for, love for those who are inside these four walls this morning. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, church, this is something that is so, so important for us. And it's often overlooked. It really is. It's overlooked. And a lot of times, it's even excused away. Or even ignored or forgotten. But I want to remind us this morning of what Jesus said in John 13, 35. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, All will know that you are mine by your love for one another. It's not all will know that you're mine by your perfect church attendance or your, 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 your intense Bible reading or all the Bible studies you're involved in. It's not all will know you're mine by those things. Again, not that those things aren't good. It's all will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. This is the mark of a new life in Christ. And church, again, this isn't, this isn't random love for people. He's not just saying, like, go out and be, like, love everybody. Again, not that that's not right, but specifically in this context, I think Jesus is talking about love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Love for one another. And church, I think I've, I've mentioned this before, but I think it, it's a worth another mention today. I, I've, I've, I've found that there are, and I think this is accurate, there are 59 one another commands that are in the New Testament. There are 59 commands in the New Testament on how we ought to function with one another. The body, brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm not going to read every one of them, but here's a few of them. Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Be at peace with each other. Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Romans 14, 13. Stop passing judgment on one another. Romans 15, 7. Accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving, forgiving one another as well. And there's a whole bunch more of one another commands that we are to live out with one another. Now here's the deal, dear church. I'm gonna say some things that you already know are true. Because we are humans, because there's a, a battle with the flesh that goes on, we have to recognize we're gonna hurt each other. We're gonna offend each other. There's going to be times where we don't honor one another above ourselves, where we're just interested in honoring ourselves, or we say something unkind, or we do something that's nasty or weird or whatever. And church, again, it's not an if. I'm not telling you it's a maybe. I'm not saying that this might happen. I'm saying this is an absolute guarantee. And I think I've told you this in regard to me as well. If, if any of you, and hopefully you haven't, if you've been here long enough, for sure you're not doing this anymore. But if any of you have ever put me up on a pedestal, you are guaranteed to be disappointed. Guaranteed. If any of you have put Pastor Derek on a pedestal, like he's never going to offend. And he's never going to do something that bothers me. 
well, you are going to be greatly disappointed. And I think half the congregation be like, yep, I testify. Yeah, he's offended me. I'm going to offend you. I'm going to bother you. I'm going to say things that maybe I shouldn't have said. This is going to happen. Now, church, again, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not trying to excuse it. I'm just reminding us that the reality is this will occur. And to think otherwise is to simply live in some kind of church fantasy land where you're headed down the road of disappointment, failed expectations. And church, we have to think about how we're going to respond when this happens. What do we do when we're offended? What do we do when we're bothered? Well, there's another one another command in Galatians chapter 5, this, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 15. That says, if we, if we respond wrongly to offense, and we will end up destroying one another. We will ruin our unity. We'll ruin our witness. You, you see, dear church, the reality of sin, our sin, and the reality of the evil one is going to fuel division in the body. Does anybody here think that, 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 that the enemy, the evil one, is content with the body of Christ walking in unity and loving one another? Does anybody here think that, that the enemy... Is this going to sit back and let that happen? Or is he constantly, and even sometimes it's not the enemy, it's just our sin. But does any of us think that there aren't going to be little wedges that kind of creep in and little offenses and this and some gossip here and some slander there? Yes, it's going to happen. Sin and the reality of an evil one is going to fuel this division. But church, we are not called to new life that looks just like the world. No, church, we're called to new life that is supposed to be mind-boggling to onlookers. We're called to something that's supernatural. This, this new life that is ours in Christ should be marked in the body of Christ by togetherness, by unity. I'm not saying in any kind of way that you have to be everybody's best friend. You don't have to be everybody's best friend. All I'm saying is we got to learn to be kind. Got to learn to be kind. Learn to listen. I don't know if God did it this way, but people say, right, you got two ears and one mouth so you can listen twice as much as you talk. Maybe that's true. It's not in the Bible, but maybe it's true. Maybe God is saying, look, learn to listen a little more. Learn to say, I'm sorry. And church, I, again, I, I, I think this is sometimes so hard for people to do. Even when they know they're wrong. Like, I know I did something wrong. I know I shouldn't have done it. I just can't say the word. I'm sorry. That's pride. And you just need to get over yourself. Learn to say, I'm sorry. Learn to say, you know what? I, I messed up. I said something I shouldn't have said. I did something I shouldn't have done. I'm very sorry. Learn to be patient. Learn to not assume you're always in the right. Learn to pray for one another. Learn to think of others above yourself. The church, the reality is we know all the stuff we're talking about here today is hard. It's difficult. It's a battle. We battle our flesh and we find it difficult oftentimes to do what's right. That's the reality. But the Bible, again, it never paints a picture for us that new life in Christ is going to be, like my kids say, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. It's not. It's a fight. It's a battle, right? It's, a, it's an uphill climb. It's crawling. It's, it's, it's new life that we live out through blood and sweat and tears. But we're fighting for it. We're pursuing it. Church, we have to fight for this new life. Love God and love your neighbor. Philippians 2.12, you know it well. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13 reminds us, for it's God who's at work in you. But the Bible has this, this, this mentality to it, this fight mentality, this soldier mentality. We have to fight for these things. The Bible is not opposed to work, dear church. The Bible's opposed to earning. The Bible's not opposed to you fighting to live what God says is right. It's, a, it's opposed to you thinking that you're earning something before God. 
And so church, my prayer for us this Christmas is that we will fight to live out the gift of new life that's been given us by God's grace through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. In other words, that we will fight to live in agreement with what God says is true of his sheep, that we have new hearts, that we have new life, that his spirit dwells within us that will fight to live in agreement with, with, with what God says, that we won't be slipping back into the flesh or that'll be happening less and less and less, but we'll fight to live in accordance with what God says is true. So church, may we be filled with joy this Christmas because of the gift of new life. Jesus, our savior came. He died on a cross and he rose from the grave And he gave us eternal life, but he also gave us abundant life to be lived here on earth. Abundant life that is marked by love for God and love for neighbor. Church, we of all people, we of all people have the greatest reason for joy. And we should remember it, that that truth this Christmas season. Amen, dear church? Let's pray and then we will eat together after we sing. Father God, we thank you this morning for the the wonderful, the the beautiful, the amazing gift of new life that you've given us. Father, we ask that you would strengthen us, encourage us, equip us to live in such a way that our love for you is growing hotter and hotter by the day. And we're learning to live humbly with one another, loving one another, and even loving those outside of this place as we share the good news of Jesus Christ with all who need to hear. Father, we pray this morning that you would help us. It is so easy for us, Lord God, to fall into the flesh, to slip back into what is the old life, to fall for the fake stuff. Father, we ask this morning that you would be with us and you would remind us that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And that Jesus Christ would be the model for the way that we live here on earth. God, may we remember this Christmas season that we of all people should be filled with supernatural joy. Joy that's overflowing because of your goodness extended to us. We pray all these things in your most holy name.